Hey, welcome to day 14 in this self-sufficiency studies series. And for today, the topic is what I call lessons from Ben Falk. Okay, Ben Falk wrote this book, The Resilient Farm and Homestead, and it is fantastic. It's been very influential to, to me and how we homestead. Now this book that you should buy and uh, read cover to cover, and then it can also be used as a reference book. I, I read this book first uh, about five, five years ago, I think, and I've read it two or three times since, and I still reference it um, quite often. It's that good. It is especially good for those that are in northern latitudes and colder climates. Okay, It's useful for, for anyone in this space that's homesteading, that's um, looking at uh, self-sufficiency, sustainability, permaculture, whole systems thinking, all of that it is useful across the board, especially relevant for those in northern latitudes and cold climates. And today is, um, like I said, lessons from Ben Falk. And I just picked 10. There's literally hundreds of lessons and principles and and things to think about in this book. I picked 10. There, there's so many, but I picked 10 and I wanna explain, I'll read a quick snippet from each one and then explain kind of how it's relevant to me and what we're doing here that is uh, reflective of that principle or lesson. All right, let's get started. And um, this book has uh, has all of these you know principles and lessons in it and they're not numbered in the way that I'm going to number them. Because again, I just picked 10 of them and I'm gonna talk through those 10. I will put a link to this book in the video notes so that you can go to it and purchase it because this is a absolutely worthwhile purchase. It should be a physical book in your library. I'm a big fan of electronic books and all that. This is one you should have on your shelf. Okay, first, first is resilience equals Diversity times redundancy times connectivity times manageability. And I'll read you a couple of little snippets here. It says the ability of a system to recover from disturbances is highest. Okay. When you, when something recovers, it is resilient. Okay. Uh, when the system is composed of a high diversity of elements, right? Where there are backup elements to all crucial components of the system, where the connections between each component form a web with as many connections and modularity as possible, but where the system is simple enough to be legible, manageable, and accessible for human participation. Okay, absolutely brilliant. Resilience equals diversity times redundancy times connectivity times manageability. We have designed our homestead here with those things in mind, absolutely. Okay, so diversity. We have, we have herb gardens that have literally dozens and dozens of different types of perennial herbaceous herbs yet there's also berries in there there's also tree fruit trees in there as well we have an edible forest garden that literally has dozens and dozens of types of fruit trees nut trees berries perennial herbaceous herbs um, annuals flowers pollinator attractors and insectaries and all this other stuff that's in there it's a highly diverse system we've also raised many different types of animal systems here Okay, all the way from pigs, goats, sheep, ducks, chickens, turkeys, rabbits, you name it. We've probably probably raised it here to have that type of, of uh, diversity. Redundancy. All those systems inherently have inside of them redundancy. To include just about everything that we do. And if you've watched many of my videos, you have probably heard me say things like every major element that is important in your system needs to have a primary, secondary, and a tertiary means of being able to supply that need. And that is really, really crucial. Okay, connectivity. We try and connect all of these different elements together. One of the biggest mistakes that I see constantly is this stove piping or compartmentalizing of different elements of property. Chickens over here, annual garden over here, Orchard, orchard over there. All those types of connections that there's so many different connections that can be made there. And again, if you, the more you do that, 
the more resilience that you build into it. And then manageability. You have to um, make sure your systems are simple enough that they are manageable. You create such a complex system, it, it goes away. Okay, so like one of the most basic things is placement of elements. If you place elements all spread out and all over the place, again, a very common mistake, it's not manageable. Okay, it's not manageable. And so we need to do even that, even though that's simple, it's a simple concept to keep things close in and tight, that inherently makes it more manageable, which inherently makes it more resilient. Okay, number two is habits of mind. I picked this one. I, I included this one because it's so crucial. Here's a snippet. The outcome of any action is highly determined by the mental frame of reference used by the actor. One has the power to shift this without dependence on outside events, people, money, or other resources. So one's own attitude management is highly empowering. Absolutely, fundamentally true. The way we think is really the foundation of anything that we're trying to do. And if we're trying to develop self-sufficiency, we need to have the attitude of someone who, who is self-sufficient or someone that is like, yeah, I will get there. I'm going to get there and I'm going, to, I am not gonna be held back and I'm not gonna be stopped from being able to do the things that I need to do in order to further my goal of, of becoming self-sufficient, okay, in some manner, okay, our attitude. Oh, I can't, I'm not, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough resources or time, I don't have time to be able to do all these things. Excuses, lame, stop, habits of mind. They have a positive mental attitude and outlook and change the way you think. You will benefit greatly if you simply work on your thinking. Okay, if you work on your thinking, naturally what's gonna follow is an increase in your ability to execute on your plans towards self-sufficiency. Okay, number three, number three. Multiple functions from single expenditures. Always do or get two or more results. Okay, this is a primary permaculture principle. All elements and actions, processes, ideally always yield more than one desired result. Okay, this is also fundamental. This, this ties back into the way you think. Okay, because a lot of times, again, people tend to be compartmentalized and we think of things as single function items. This is a single function tool. This is a single function animal. I get eggs from the chickens. Okay, I, I get eggs from the ducks. We need to change our thinking on this, okay? Multiple functions from every element. That's the bottom line. So let me show you a couple things and I'm just gonna bear with me. Okay, so let's see if I can do this. I, like right behind me is my little rainwater catchment tower. Okay, so right there, there we go. Rainwater catchment tower. Now that obviously catches rainwater. Okay, it's a little rainwater catchment system and we have a bunch of those all over here. That primarily supplies water, back it up, for that hoop house right down there. Okay, that hoop house right there. That's the primary function of that rainwater right there. But that rainwater is also an emergency backup for our household, okay? We have um, our well water that's our primary, obviously, drinking water, cooking, bathing, all that kind of stuff. We do have a, a backup to be able to get that well water in, a, in the form of a hand pump, okay? But our, our secondary water for our, our drinking is really rainwater, okay? So we run that rainwater through a Berkey and we're off to the races. And our tertiary, because I told you we always come up with primary, secondary, and tertiary, is pond water, okay? So we have pond water. We have a pond, like a pond down there, for example. And again, um, I would be using rainwater before I used pond water. Okay, so that's an example of multiple elements from each function. Um, also, let's see if you can see these guys right here. All right, there's some ducks right there. Ducks. Ducks are great. Love ducks here. We have, we've had ducks here for years. And ducks can provide eggs, and we get duck eggs. Ducks can provide meat, so when we're culling and we mainly have, we have raised meat ducks specifically, 
uh, but we generally raise um, egg laying ducks, khaki campbells or whatever, and but we'll cull. You know, they hatch out ducklings. Uh, we will cull some and then we use them for meat. We also will run them through our edible forest garden uh, to be able to let them work in that area, dropping nutrient, keeping pest pressure down, um, eating some of the vegetation that's in there, all of that. So you can see that's a it's a mindset shift. You take everything and there's usually usually multiple things that you can get out of each element okay so multiple functions for each element what a great principle all right number four skills are your most durable resource okay beyond land tools money even friends and family your own skills including those soft and hard from growing a potato to making a friend are your most dependable asset your own aptitudes are therefore for, there for you to rely on no matter the condition of the world in which you find yourself Okay, there's, there's much more in there, but I'm going to stick with that. I've beat this dead horse uh, a lot. I did a, an entire day in this series based on, on, uh, on basically being a generalist instead of a specialist. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was called Specialization is for Insects. And I can't remember which day it is, but it doesn't matter. And essentially what that means is just developing a wide range of skills and I even talked about how to learn a skill quickly. And that is a, that's a skill in, in and of itself. It's how can I take something that I want to learn and learn the fundamental basics of it in order to be able to do that skill relatively well. Okay, so that's, that is a, uh, that's something that uh, you should pursue and develop a wide set of skills. Okay, we've done that here. Every, anything from animal processing to being able to, to graft fruit trees, to grow and propagate plants in other ways, animal husbandry, uh, being able to fix certain things, build certain things, uh, to develop rainwater catchment systems, alternative energy systems, you name it. We've tried to build it. Not, not that we're an expert in any of those. Okay, because we haven't done massive, massive amounts of repetitions. Although in some areas we've done a lot, a lot of them. And so we, what we have done is been able to get pretty good at a lot of different skills. And I think that's where it's at when you want to develop self-sufficiency. Okay, number five, number five. Figure it out, try stuff. Trying a wide variety of approaches is crucial to finding the best solutions specific to your unique situation. Fear and lack of confidence retards this. Be confident try stuff that's beautiful okay uh just like we've talked about many times is is that uh, whether it's you know building multiple skills or uh, just giving things a shot we talk about that here a lot just start you don't need to have all of the information to start something you know some people um approach say raising animals and others say no 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 you you know don't before you get these animals, you need to understand everything that you need to know about, you know, raising, breeding, um, caring, feeding, yada, yada, yada. I say that's bogus. Get some knowledge, get, get that, you know, there's 20% of things that you can learn about that skill that will get you 80% of the way there. Pick that up really quick and then start, try it. And this obviously also feeds back into um, the mindset. Okay, about thinking and trying. So not being afraid to try. Be confident, step out, give it a shot. Okay, number six. And I picked this one just because it's fun and I do it all the time. And that is pee on plants. There you go. There's the lesson, pee on plants. It says closing the fertility cycle between humans and the system that feed us is fundamental. Absolutely. Why not? You know, it's just one small way of closing the loop on that fertility cycle, okay? Or, or closing it a little bit more. Not totally closing it, but closing it a little bit more. Pee on plants, pee next to plants. I do this all the time, especially when the weather is nicer and I'm out in the edible forest garden or wherever. I'm not gonna go inside to pee. And I, you know, I'm not necessarily gonna just gonna go pee in the woods. I'm gonna pee right next to a plant. I usually do pee next to it, not on it. All right, number seven. Number seven is annual perennial balance in a system. 
In general, the more growing space available, the more brittle the climate, the steeper the slope, and the less fertile the soil, the more crucial role the role of perennial food plants. Whereas the less space available, the less brittle the climate, the lower the slope, and the more fertile the soil, the greater the role annuals should play in an agro ecosystem, if they play a role at all. Okay, what he's saying there is like there's an appropriate place for perennials and annuals. Ideally, we would all, regardless of the place, move to a more perennial based system. It could be why? Because it's ultimately more resilient. Okay, but either way, you know, annuals do play their, their role and they play their role here as well. However, how that impacts us. So this perfectly explains our situation. We are on, on a sloped property, okay? Um, and our, you know, our land is sloped. So therefore, perennials make up the majority of our system. That is the, the, the fundamental foundation of our system of where we meet some of our own needs from our property is a perennial based system. Supplementing that, is annuals okay supplementing that we have our hoop house where we grow annuals and we have certain little niches and spots where we do grow annuals we, we grow annuals in our on our deck in, in containers and gardens the, the rest of it the other primary functions are perennial based same thing with animals okay you can almost think of animals as a, an annual or perennial based system um you know right in a way okay if you if you get a bunch of broilers you raise them for eight weeks and you process them. That's kind of equivalent to annual agriculture. Okay, you, you get uh, some some chickens as layers and you're keeping them over multiple years and then you know switching them out on a, some type of, of rotation. That's more like a perennial based system. Okay, so for us, ducks and chickens right now are, are kind of perennial based systems. When we have pigs and we might get pigs and we'll get them as piglets in the spring, raise them out, and then process them in the fall is more like an annual-based system, okay? So in my opinion, at least for our property, it makes 100% sense to go more perennial with a supplementation of annual growth, and that's what we've done. Number eight, cheap tools are too costly. <laughs> I think we can all probably agree on that. You go and buy something, some very, very cheap pruners, or something and it falls apart in no time and and you're just kicking yourself because you know you went too cheap okay and, and there's another good saying that says you can't afford to go cheap okay and that's so true it's uh, only high quality well-made tools and materials are worthwhile unless the goal is short-term poorly done work so true um, we need to, to figure out those things that are crucial and buy high quality tools it's better to have fewer high quality tools than lots of low quality junk tools. Okay, number nine, storage always runs out. Stockpiling of energy or materials, while often a valuable strategy, must always be tempered with the need to renew such stores. All physical resources eventually perish and therefore renewal is crucial. The balance between storage and renewal is in constant flux and should always be recognized and adjusted for. Absolutely crucial. And in this series, I did a, um, an entire video on stockpiling. But if you can't didn't get the theme, I basically started with, basically with saying that stockpiling does not replace knowledge, skills, abilities. It does not replace the ability to renew those resources, right? It's one thing to store a barrel, a 55-gallon barrel of water in your garage, for example, as a backup. And that's fine, uh, but it's a whole other thing to set up a rainwater catchment system that continually catches water as it continues to rain. That right? That's a renewable way of of capturing water. Okay, as one example, um, and there are so many other ways to look at that. Same thing with food, right? So we can have a food storage, right? You could have fifty five pound bags of whole wheat berries in your pantry which is again, totally fine. And then here it's another thing to grow food on your, on your property. Okay. And maybe wheat berries is a bad example. We don't grow any grains here per se. Okay. But it's the same thing. If I have canned vegetables in food storage, but I also grow a lot of 
vegetables, fresh vegetables and greens from year to year. And this is the same thing, right? We can have storage and that's good, but you need to also balance that out with renewing that storage. Even better, if you can take your own things that you're growing and make that your storage, that's like that's like a graduate school right there. Okay, and number 10, last but not least, is clarity points and leverage points in time. Throughout the year, there are periods punctuated by intense windows in time when one can see how the systems around them function. This is so true. This is um, area times like now, which is this kind of transition between uh, you know early spring, where things are warming up, snow's melting, all of that. Okay, and additionally, in, in times where you get like heavy rainstorms or or rain after a long dry spell. Okay, so let me give you an example because this is where I have gained absolutely the most knowledge of my property by really paying attention, observing at these crucial times, okay? Because they really are crucial. So if you look behind me, you can see areas where there's still snow on the ground, okay, all the way across there. And then if we come continued over, over there by the barn, it gets drier and drier, etc. Okay, so we see all that, the difference is there. Those types of things, that that is informing me on, you know, where are the sunnier areas? Okay, so in this case, where are the sunnier areas? Where are the shadier areas? And therefore, what areas are going to be drier? Okay, for, as opposed to which areas are going to be moister? And all that can tell me, in, in this case, for example, where I might plant certain things as opposed to planting other things. What, th what things do well in moister sites or as opposed to drier sites? Okay, all those types of things can tell me what I need to know, okay, by observation, close, close observation. All right, another great time, I mentioned this before, is like during during uh, rain. Uh, when it rains, especially like a, a little bit heavier rain, um, you can really get a chance to observe water flow, okay, at the micro level even. And I, I do that, and I walk around when, when it's raining, I can, uh, I know which, I know the, the flows of the water on this property and, and how it's flowing and um, opportunities to be able to slow it down. Where does it naturally slow down? Where can I impact that in that system? Where where is the leverage point for me uh, to be able to do that? Okay, so enough on that. Um, crucial points and leverage uh, points in time. Okay, very very critical. Okay, all of these are just ten of um, hundreds of gems in this book. So again, recommend you buy the book own the book, read the book, all that good stuff. Excellent. 10 lessons from Ben Falk.